everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's me, CJ. I feel like I haven't done this in a long time. And you're watching CJ. Yow! I had a terrible manicure today. I don't know if you can see the level of clownery that's going on, but this is not what I asked for. This is not what the picture looked like and was just like further confirmation to myself that I am colorblind. If anyone else is out there colorblind, any red green colorblind hotties, just shout me out. I feel your pain. <laughs> anyway, I'm doing an August reading wrap up today. August was a pretty good reading month, pretty varied I would say, genre wise. I really went there, it was pretty exploratory, had a lot of time to read at the spa with my mom. You've seen the video, you've seen the vlogs, great, love it. And we're gonna talk about it. Does that sound great? First off, let's talk about The Performance by Claire Thomas. This is an Australian author. I believe this is their debut novel. I really, really enjoyed this. This book is contained in the context of a Samuel Beckett play. Couple caveats, I'm not a theater person, so like I think some of the undertones of who Samuel Beckett is and what that means were probably lost on me but uh, I really did like the structure of kind of confining these three characters we follow in a space and having it be so prescriptive of why they were there. They were all there for the same purpose, which was to watch this play by Samuel Beckett, right? It takes place during the Australian wildfire season. So these three characters come from different demographics and various backgrounds. We have like a woman in her mid 60s, a woman in her 40s, and like a young queer mixed race to girl. Definitely like a thinky, insular, interior of the mind book, right? The majority of this book is not about the play at all. It's about kind of where these characters' minds are roaming as they're watching the play and what it brings up for them and what it reminds them of and takes their brain basically. I found that really relatable and well done, just how interior monologues of your own brain go when you're in a public space and everyone seems to be doing or witnessing or taking part in the same thing in this, in this uh, case a play, but really you're just in your own little world, aren't you? So we're in these characters' own little worlds, we explore themes of memory, loss, queerness, attraction, familial bonds, abuse, memory loss, dementia. I think the expiration of um, the older woman who is in her 60s, her husband is starting to go through the early stages of dementia and her accounting for the violence that has come upon her because of that change was really well done and something and a perspective and an experience that was new to me. I didn't know that that was pretty common in people who are suffering from memory loss to turn violent. There's some experimental things going on in the form. This little gray section of the book, if you can see it, is happening during intermission where all three of our characters cross paths in one way or another. And I thought that was really well done too. I would have been happy if no one ever crossed paths and these three distinct characters never spoke to each other, but I didn't feel like forced in or tied in at all. It seemed pretty organic and like it should happen naturally. So overall, I really liked this book. I mean, just meditative, thinky DWMs, chilling in a playhouse while the world burns. Aren't we all in a playhouse while the world burns? Isn't it all just a performance, you know what I mean? Loving the Australian writers happening. They're, they're having a renaissance there or something. Also, this was my um, watercolor painting that I made and I used it as a bookmark, so... Sorry, I'm an artist, I don't know what to tell you. I also read Pet this month. I had an entire reading vlog dedicated to it, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time recounting this. This follows a young trans girl named Pet who lives in this kind of imaginary near future world where all monsters, AKA like evil, <laughs> have been banished from the world. And she meets a creature that comes out of her mother's artwork at night who is sent to track down a monster, which is 
kind of unsettling for Jam. Hasn't encountered a monster in her lifetime. It's just kind of folklore to her at this point. I'm not a generally a YA reader, but I did enjoy this for the most part. I don't think it's something I'm going to be turning back to, but I really like a quickie Meze's work and think that their ability to jump between genres and demographics is super impressive. And I really enjoyed the friendship that took place between Jam, our main character, and her best friend Redemption, and the different kinds of family structures that this book explored that are existing outside of the binary. I thought that was super well done. Everyone knows your mother is a witch. I wanted to like this more than I did, I'm gonna be honest. Like I'm having a hard time recalling it already, which is not a great sign but I will try my best. Uh, I've read the other Rivka Galchin book, which was called How Should a Person Be? Was that it? No, that's probably an Allie Smith book, isn't it? Motherhood? What was the other Rivka Galchin book I have? It's not listed in the back on her bio, so maybe she doesn't like it, but this is my second time reading this author, all of that to say. Yes, this is set in the 1600s in Germany and is kind of a witch hunt narrative. We're watching a witch hunt happen, a supposed witch hunt. We follow Katerina, who is a real woman. She was the mother of the famous mathematician, um, Thomas Kepler, I believe is his name. And the one thing this book did have working for it was a strong voice. Katerina was funny and wry and snarky and fully embodied and I felt like I knew her as a character. I think having someone feel so relatable and realized, even though this book was set in the 1600s, is a feat among itself, right? There are a few moments when I, you know, chuckled out loud at her interactions with other townspeople just because Katerina is a character who openly is abrasive and doesn't care what consequences may come because of her personality which is just fun as a viewer to watch so i liked that what else do i remember yeah it's like written in the form of her neighbor simon recounting her story because she's illiterate so there's this kind of like storytelling motif narrative thing that's happening almost like and then this is the part of the story, you know, it like kind of breaks that wall and tells you where it's at in progression of what happened. And they also inclu include a lot of transcripts from other townspeople who are accusing Katarina of being a witch and kind of their court testimonies, which I think is not ever my favorite thing. The one book that I'm thinking about that doesn't, that does it very differently is what is that book where it's like a miracle submarine and they go in the it's like a courtroom drama book everyone really liked it except me um i'll put it here but they use that same structure i'm sure that has a literary term that i'm not thinking of but the use of court documentation and witness trials right not my favorite weird one read if you like historical fiction and gossip maybe not my fave. Kudos, some Cuskiana, am I right? I dropped this in the pool, so it is destroyed, which is kind of annoying because, you know, this trilogy is pretty much only known for being beautiful to look at, and I ruined one of them. <laughs> Just kidding. What a dig to Rachel Cusk. She's only pretty to look at. This might have been my least favorite of the Outline trilogy. We are following our character at a literary event in, I wonder what country it takes place in. It's a hot country. Is it Spain maybe? I don't know if it ever explicitly tells you what country this writing, this writing festival has taken place in, but it's very much so similar in form to the other two outline books. Popping in and out of conversations and kind of this observant, omnipresent look at one's life, right? I would say that's the most striking thing that hit me while reading this last cusk was I think that's her thing. And to say it plainly, I think her thing is recounting conversations that she might have had in real life and maybe expanding on them and 
intuiting maybe what was not said because the conversations and dialogue that happen in all of the Cusk outline trilogy are not real. Like, <laughs> people do not talk like this. It's not dialogue that I have heard passing between friends or even in like academic situations. It's really elegant and philosophical at all times. I feel like when characters are speaking to each other in the outline trilogy it's always removed from a sense of reality and i think that's what cusk does really well is kind of mutates something as common as dialogue between two people into the unexpected and like the the beautiful and the pristine really yeah not my favorite though i think i read it in the wrong place um i didn't really allow myself to read it in a couple of sittings which i found has been most successful for me when I'm outline trilogying, but kind of contemplative about the author, maleness in authorship, who receives awards and who doesn't, kind of seemed writing for her own industry in this case. So there weren't a ton of like universal truths that stuck out to me, except for the stuff about like gender and, and power divides in relationships. I think that is something she continues to explore in this trilogy really well because as I understand it it's focused on kind of like the end and delusion of her, disillusion of her marriage and her settling into her new future. Also lots of talks about Brexit in this book. The story of a new name. The story of a new name. I don't know why I'm singing that but I finished it. <laughs> I liked this book. I really liked this book. Hard to get into. I feel like I don't need to tell you what this book is about, but it is gossipy, conspiratorial, full of teenage angst, both merited and unmerited. Kind of the disillusionment that love can cast over your brain. And again just a beautiful nuanced layered look at female friendship and this weird little town in naples and all of these characters who are moving through poverty and violence and trying to do their best for one another and fucking up continuously can't wait to read the next ones but it is something that i like floating in and out of i'll probably give myself a couple of months before i jump back into this again okay those are all the physical books i have that i read but i did read some on my kindle i read the new david sedaris collection of diaries i know i'm blessed i basically um threw a fit in the little brown instagram dms and i was like you don't understand like please approve me for this on net galley i'm gonna die without it and i don't know if someone read it or it was just luck of the net galley gods but i got approved and i read most of it in one sitting on the plane ride home which is crazed fan behavior i feel like that's absolutely not how you're intended to read either of his diary collections but it was pretty fun for me to do it that way anyway. If you don't know, David Sedaris is like an avid diarist. He's kept a diary every day for like the last 50 years or something insane like that. And I would say I enjoyed his first collection a lot more than I enjoyed this one, only because the last 20 years of his life, he's been an accomplished author and a lot of his life is touring and buying expensive things with his husband and kind of just like more cushy, less rising to stardom and finding his way through the world than the first collection of diaries was. There's like true hilarious moments in here. He recounts 9-11, the Donald Trump election, um, the passing of his sister Tiffany. So there were a lot of interesting cultural like observations um, that are funny to see through his like satire lens, right? But there was also just like some whiny complaining like 60 year old white man acknowledgements of like i didn't get first class but he also acknowledges that and he's like wow look how far i've come i'm such an asshole but there's only so much you can read of that you know what i mean i love you david i would die for you i'm actually seeing david sedaris in Woo! what <laughs> kiki just screamed david uh we love david I'm seeing him in Portland do a reading in a few weeks, like two weeks from now, which is very exciting. 
wonder if he'll be doing book signings because of, because of COVID. If anyone has seen him on tour in the time of COVID, let me know if he was doing signing. The other book I read on my Kindle was True Story, What Reality TV Says About Us by Danielle Lindman. Um, this is a piece of nonfiction meditating on the sociological impacts of reality TV and then exploring how it ties into culture at large. I was hoping for something more nuanced and unexpected from this book. Um, it's very much so surface level. It does explore like the me, the I, the friend groups. It's kind of like an anthropological exploration of reality TV and like sociology, if that makes sense. And I don't know, I didn't really come away with it with anything new that I learned or that I enjoyed reading through it. Um, I wish it tied into more of like, like my thoughts on reality TV or like it's so pervasive that it's even infiltrated down to like on a singular person level. Like this is the CJ show. You're watching the CJ show on YouTube right now. You go on Instagram stories, everyone is just like in their own reality of thinking that their content and they are producing their own TV show. It didn't tie into that at all or social media, which I think was a miss. Um, but maybe that just like wasn't what the book was trying to explore. Not my favorite, kind of surface level. Like, yeah, everyone's obsessed with watching TV, but um, what else? You know? Ooh, and then I read How to Pronounce Knife, which is a collection of short stories. I read this with the book hotties. Well, some of them. Cough, cough, Karen. And I really enjoyed it. I thought this was a really beautiful and singular collection about displacement and um, the new immigrant experience and really messy, hideous parts of what that looks like for people, both emotionally and physically. I mean, there's like visceral descriptions of chicken factories and plucking um, the feathers off animals and what it means to make a living, support your family, support yourself, and like create meaning out of all of those things. Um, I believe it's a Laotian writer. Is that how you say Laotian? Laos, right? How to pronounce. Yeah, born in Thailand in a Lao refugee camp. So a lot of Lao origin stories speaking from experience and people she knows. So I really liked that. Laos. There is a common question. Laos. I said it right, okay. I hate saying things wrong. So that are that's the books I read. Um it was a pretty good reading month. I'm now reading another nonfiction book about climate change and hoping to pick up a novel soon, but I'm not really in the mood for like a millennial novel. I thought I was gonna pick up three rooms, but I haven't. Other things that are going in, on in my life, seeing David Sedaris, that'll be fun. Jalen might come in October to Portland, so we might do a little collab collab. Enjoying the last of the good weather, chilling hard, trying to survive a busy work fall. I'm playing a new video game called Garden Story. It's like out by an indie publisher and I'm liking it so far. If anyone has a good action adventure game that is kind of like Zelda, but maybe like a different art style and easier than Zelda, let me know. I am searching for the next adventure game that catches my eye and wins my heart, but I've not found it. I have a Switch and an Xbox. Do with that what you will. I hope you had a good reading month. Let me know if you did. And I'll see you later. Bye.